Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you've given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Okay. So today we're going to talk about translating the Bible, which at first may not seem like the most fascinating thing, but I think it's quite interesting, and I think this will be a pretty useful sort of 40-minute session to think about uh, all sorts of things when you're reading and hearing the scriptures and maybe what's on your bookshelves as well. So we'll start with a basic question of what Bible, if you even know, what translation of the Bible do each of you have? Yes. I have a very recent one. Um, I mean, I, I the Common English Bible. Common English Bible. Very good. Okay. Anybody else? Well, I had the NRSV. I don't know where I put it. So I ordered the 199 version, but I That's have the King English James. Bible in front of me. Okay. Charlotte, I can't hear you. Can you hear us? You know, yeah, I haven't said anything because my Bibles are downstairs on another level. I'm going to go down and get, get at oh, least one Oh, that's okay. Of them. You don't have to get them. It's okay. But uh, um, Jim, what do you guys have? Uh, we have the, uh, right here, we have the uh, authorized King James Version. Okay, great. So there's, just from this group, we've gotten at least three different Bibles. The King James, which is from uh, a couple hundred years ago, which still is a great translation. It's clearly a little archaic in some ways. Uh, it's hard to read for some people, but it's very good for other people. And it's uh, certainly something that's worth having and knowing about. The NRSV, and as a little bit of a path, the other name for the King James, which Jim said is the authorized version. And the new revised standard version, which Barbara has, is supposed to be in the same path out of the authorized version. The authorized version has been revised a couple of times. There was a revised version, and then there was the revised standard version, and then there's now recently the new revised standard version. And it's they're not using the King James as their base point in how to translate everything, but they're using their King James in terms of a lot of the decisions and phrasing that are made. So the NRSV sounds more like the King James than the NIV, the New International Version, which is a big evangelical Bible, or the NASB, which is the New American Standard Bible, which is a Catholic Bible, or the, uh, which one is this thing called? The, the New American Bible, which is another Catholic Bible. Sounds very colloquial. The NRSV, the RSV, the RV and the King James all kind of sound the same in some way, shape, or form, but it's a couple hundred years difference. So it's hard to pick up that the New Revised Standard Version and the King James are trying to sort of mirror each other in some way. The Common English Bible, which Sherry mentioned, is probably the newest of the bunch in terms of translations, and it's a very, very academic translation that's also trying to straddle the line of being pretty colloquial. And it too is an excellent translation. And the ones that I have on my shelf behind me for what it's worth in easy reach are the Common English Bible. Note it says a study Bible. Uh, mm. I have a Common English Bible that's not a study Bible. The difference is pretty obvious, right? Same Bible, one has notes. Um, the New American Standard Bible. This is a pretty common Catholic Bible. I have numerous copies of the New Revised Standard Version. This is my HarperCollins one. I've got an Oxford one at home. And the Revised Standard Version. And the New English Bible as well. And what else do I have? Um, the English Standard Version. This is another good one. This is an evangelical one. Um, and Greek, Latin up there, that kind of thing, Hebrew. Um, they're all good and they all serve a purpose. If you, when you do buy a Bible at some point, um, 
there's a reason not to buy a study Bible, and it's because you want to be able to carry it around with you to wherever you happen to go. Like, <laughs> this is far more useful if I feel like lugging a Bible around than the study Bible. But for the most part, a study Bible is more useful, and it's because it has notes on uh, textual stuff, it has notes on content, and it, they generally have good introductions and historical summaries of every single book. So I highly recommend, if you don't have one, picking up a study Bible of some sort. And the translations matter to a degree, but any of the ones I just mentioned are all quite good. And for what it's worth, I tend to use the new Revised Standard Version and the Revised Standard Version. Canon Susan tended to use the, uh, the, which one was that? the Common English Bible and the New Revised Standard Version. So the Episcopal Church in general, most Episcopal churches you'll run into are using the New Revised Standard Version. Um, but we do have the option of using a number of different translations, and it may or may not surprise you that that's legislated in the Episcopal Church. We can't use any translation we want. Only certain translations are allowed, and all of the ones that I mentioned are all allowed. So the reason why a certain translation wouldn't be allowed is, and we'll run into this a little bit when we start looking at some of the texts, there's a couple of translations. One is the message, and another is um, the Amplified Bible um, that take really different tacks, and there's other scriptures like this. The message is basically a paraphrase, so we don't read paraphrases in church. And the Amplified Bible is trying to give you all of the different meanings that could be there, so it's a big mess when you try to read it. It will say things like, God sent his spirit, breath, wind, out into the world, when normally we would just have one word, right? So, okay. That's the first part is that there are Bibles out there. You all have different ones. Um, a little bit of background. I assume everybody knows, and if not, then we'll move past this quickly, that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. It's not exactly that simple because the... Uh, very early on, there was a Greek translation or translations of the Hebrew scriptures, and those were circulated really, really, really widely, and they're generally called, the ones that are passed down to us is generally referred to as the Septuagint, and there's a story behind that that I won't get into, but it's, you can look it up if you want, but the Septuagint was for a couple hundred years before Christ, the authoritative Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, and it was used all over the place in the, the areas that Jews lived alongside the Hebrew scriptures, which were and always were the authoritative ones. The, the Greek ones were read as a translation that people could use, but they were commonly read. And by the time we got to the early church, and the first generation of evangelists and writers, people like St. Paul or the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Septuagint and other versions of the scriptures, of the, Greek, the Hebrew scriptures, were so commonplace that some of the versions in other languages uh, get into the New Testament when they're quoting these things. So they're quoting them into... The New Testament in uh, it, from the translation rather than from the Hebrew scriptures. And so that's just a general complication when you're trying to translate things into English, for example. So if you're looking at a New Testament text and you know that St. Matthew is quoting from the book of Isaiah, and you look at the Hebrew text of Isaiah and it says one thing, and you look at the Greek text of Isaiah and it says a slightly different thing. What do you do? Do you want to know what the most famous verse is of all that? Okay, it's, I'll share my screen. It's Matthew chapter one. And can you all see my screen now? Oh, yep. my, okay, so this is the King James. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and be with child and she shall bear forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel. 
uh, which being interpreted is God with us, right? We all know this verse. We hear it every year, right? This is the famous verse. And if you go back into my search for virgin, uh, I'll just change it to, if I can spell, which I can't, I can't spell. And we go to Isaiah, this is in the King James, right? Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, right? This is the exact same thing. What if I go to a different translation? Uh, let's go to the New Revised Standard Version. Isaiah 7, 11. And we get, where'd it go? Ah, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Manuel. What is the difference between these two translations? Look, the young woman. <laughs> the young woman, right? Mm -hmm. Well, note there's a note here. So what does the note say? It says, young woman, Greek, the virgin. So in Hebrew, it seems to be young woman, but in the Greek version, it's the virgin. So you do have some different uh, and sometimes fairly significant variants. Now, that doesn't mean that this didn't mean in Hebrew virgin. It just means that the Greek is a more precise translation of that, whereas young woman is a much broader thing. It could mean young woman. It could mean virgin. It could mean all sorts of things. Um but the Greek, then when they translated it into Greek, they translated it specifically as virgin. So these matters of translation actually really make a huge difference. And again, I'll jump back to the King James because it depends on what Bible you're reading out of, which translation you get. Uh, and also the verses are different. <laughs> In the King James, this is verse 14. That's a whole other issue. So that's a big deal in terms of how these translations go. And it's it starts with the challenge of, and the reality that the scriptures, the Old Testament itself, the authoritative Jewish ones are in Hebrew. The authoritative Christian ones, it kind of depends who you ask. From the Catholic Church, uh, their starting point is generally gonna be the Septuagint. The Orthodox Church, the same thing. And in our church, it's a little bit of both. So we kind of have, you can't just um, say, oh, it was in Hebrew, because the Greek versions were so important that they were passed down and they've become authoritative in a, in a very essential way. Before I jump into a couple of other things, does anybody have any questions on that whole business of Greek, Hebrew, Septuagint, uh, anything like that? Uh, Matt, I, I, I may be a little off the track. I should have asked earlier. What is the church's position on the Good News Bible? Because that's what I'm actually looking at right now. Uh, I'd have to look that up. I'm not sure that's listed in our canons. I, if I can during this all. Uh, no problem. I, no problem. Thanks. I'll see if I can find it in the next minute or two um, while I'm doing a couple of other things. Uh, a so, quick question, Father Matt. Yeah. Quick question. Am I understanding okay? Like the original, the four Gospels, right? And uh, the Matthew, Luke, uh, and Mark, and John. I thought they are, he they are in Hebrew, right? Because the Greek at that time is only for the intellectuals, like Saint Paul, of course, uh, was written. No, uh, um, in Greek. The the Greek was the equivalent of English. It was not the intellectual language. Greek was the language of, there were, it would be very similar to in this country where many local cultural groups, whether they had lived here for a long time or had recently emigrated into this country may speak at home their first you know, original language. A friend of mine is, his family was from Estonia. They spoke Estonian at home uh, and he still speaks Estonian uh, sort of pretty regularly. And uh, 
but he grew up in this country. And so he's fluent in Estonian. It's probably his first language and he speaks English perfectly. English was the language of business and everything at Jesus's time. And that doesn't just mean intellectual stuff. It meant that if you wanted to go to buy uh, vegetables in a market that wasn't a specific market for your people, you needed to know Greek. If you wanted to know, uh, so probably almost everybody knew their local language and Greek as well, and may have known Latin because that was the official Roman language, but in the eastern part of the empire, Greek was pretty much the common tongue. And it, as an example of that, the letters and gospels in the New Testament are not really polished Greek. They're pretty, some of them are pretty raw Greek. St. John is raw Greek. St. Mark is raw Greek. St. Luke and Acts are pretty polished Greek. He was clearly somebody that knew how to write Greek and knew how to tell stories in a written way. But a lot of the other writings are less polished. And so, and that actually gets into translating them. Often the translations will, and St. John, translations of St. John do this all the time. Often translations will try to make it sound like high theology, which it may be, but it's kind of raw uh, common Greek. There's a giant, I took a lot of Greek in high school and college, and there is an absolutely enormous difference between like Socratic, Platonic, Greek, the, the plays that, you know, Aeschylus, uh, uh, um, I can't, uh, the very uh, Aristophanes, that kind of stuff is much more polished Greek than what you get in the New Testament. And let me grab a translation um, behind me. I, I don't necessarily recommend buying this because it's not that cheap, but this is the New Testament. And this guy, what he's tried to do is to make the Greek sound like it would have to original hearers in English. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example, because this is kind of jarring. Um, okay, this is the gospel according to John, how he translates it. His, this is just one guy, but this is an assumption of what it probably would have sounded like 2000 years ago to somebody picking up the gospel according to John, uh, who was unfamiliar with, who may or may not have been familiar with it. In the origin, there was the Logos, and the Logos was present with God, and the Logos was God. This one was present with God in the origin. All things came to be through him, and without him came to be not a single thing that has come to be. In him was life, and this life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. It goes on like that, and it's hard to, it's not, it's not um, beautiful in the sense that you would think of poetry or Shakespearean this or that. It's kind of raw. When you read these things in Greek, they're, they're pretty, um, they're fairly common. And that's, that's the, the, one of the real challenges that Bible translations try to make. The King James nowadays sounds very, you know, regal and this and that. Would it have sounded like that when people actually spoke like that is a totally different thing. And it's so as you get more archaic in terms of a translation, it often seems more formal because the language has changed. And so you're using archaic words, you're using archaic phrasing, and it's not necessarily that language gets dumbed down. Sometimes it does, but sometimes things just change in such a way that an older version sounds more educated, mostly because you have to be more educated to understand the older version not necessarily that it was more educated to begin with. So yeah. all of that is to say is there's a reason, the, the, one of the things that's worth looking up with some of these translations is, so the NRSV and the RSV, I think are something like a second or year at college level reading Bible. And the NIV, the new international version is like a high school level Bible. And 
realistically, the NIV, which is not my favorite translation for all sorts of reasons, may be closer in terms of how uh, common it sounds to the original Greek texts. And that's a real danger because sometimes people, uh, I've had this happen before where people, they, they, they look at the King James and they say, this is what it said in this beautiful language. It's like, this is Elizabethan mm -hmm. language. It was beautiful by default. It's a different thing. And that was just how the, what the language was. The New Testament itself in Greek is not so beautiful in that same way. It's beautiful in a different way. The content is beautiful, but the, the writing style itself, and this in and of itself, I think is wonderful. The writing style is for every person. It was not designed, the New Testament was not designed for people that were super duper educated to have to understand. It was written so that your average person who worked in a fish you know, store or who worked um, as you know, the, the fishermen or the farmers that Jesus talked about and was with, that they could pick it up and read it. Why? Because those are the people that were writing it, right? Yeah. I mean, St. Paul was an educated person, but his business was a tent maker. And St. Peter, we don't know how educated he was. He owned a business of some sort because he was a fisherman, but he also was working with his fishermen, right? And uh, yeah. so it's that's who they were written for. And that's pretty important to understand. Um, Anything else? I I, I want to move a little faster, but anything else before we jump into some text? Okay, so there are a couple of major issues when you are translating uh, the Bible. The Greek and Hebrew versions, a big one which I won't dwell on, is the list of books, and sometimes what is in those books is a little different. You've probably heard of the Apocrypha or the Deuteral Canonical books, and painting with kind of a broad brush, the apocryphal or deuterocanonical books are those books or parts of books of the Old Testament that are in Greek, but do not appear in Hebrew. So, for example, the Maccabees are books that we very rarely read in church. The Maccabees are in our Bibles, but they are part of the apocrypha. Uh, the at least uh, third and fourth Maccabees and the um, so does that mean they're not used in the Jewish faith or um, well Maccabees are but the, so there's I there's third and fourth Maccabees are in the Apocrypha uh, books of Esdras are in the Apocrypha there's um, the story of Bell and the dragon from the book bits of the book of Daniel are in the Apocrypha and yes the short answer is no they're not in the Hebrew scriptures and part of the Jewish canonical scriptures. Um, first and second Maccabees are, third and fourth Maccabees are not. And the way the church thinks about these books is deuterocanonical is the best way of thinking about them. They are part of our canon, but they are secondary. The book of Tobit is another one. There's some wonderful books and stories in there, but they were not ever passed down to anybody in Hebrew, which probably means they were not written in Hebrew. They were probably written in Greek. And because of that, at some point, uh, Jewish scholars and leaders determined what their canon was, which is the list, and their canon included only things that were in Hebrew. And so they cut out these other things. They didn't say they were garbage. They just said, this is not part of our canon. The Christians did not do the exact same thing. They said, our canon is the Septuagint, but we also recognize that these secondary books that are not written in Hebrew do not have the exact same status as the primary ones. Thus, they're called deuterocanonical or second canon, if that makes sense. And when you get to Protestantism in the Reformation, they look back and say, oh, well, the Jewish scriptures are these, and um, and the Catholic scriptures have these extra books, and the Orthodox scriptures have these extra books. Let's throw out the extra books, or let's, if we're going to keep them in, we'll call them the Apocrypha to make it even more distinct. So you can buy Bibles, and this is a good example. Um, if you buy a Bible, you want to buy a Bible that says, with the Apocrypha, <laughs> right? Because you can buy a Bible that doesn't have that, and that's fine but then you'll be missing some books that you might want to read from time to time. Uh, so that's a major difference. Uh, 
when you begin to translate is whether you're going to include those or not. Most, if not all, academic translations will always translate the apocryphal or deuterocanonical books, and they usually plunk them in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So they're distinct, but still in there. You get into a couple of more really challenging things with translations because you're dealing at the end of the day with manuscripts, right? You're not dealing with copies of books passed down from generation to generation for most of history. You're dealing with people handwriting things, right? And uh, they're, they're copying it by hand. And if you begin to dig into the history of manuscripts, I believe, and this may be out of date, but when I was in seminary 20 years ago, there were 5,000 different manuscripts that made up the New Testament. That's not the Old Testament, just the New Testament. 5,000 different manuscripts. So you've got doubles of things, triples of things, quadruples. Sometimes you've got uh, fewer versions of things. Sometimes you have fragments of things, like a verse here or there that dates from 2,000 years ago. And that verse from 2,000 years ago that's on somebody's locket or something like that, um, agrees exactly with one manuscript and disagrees with four others. And you look at these manuscripts and the one it agrees with is as old as the, man, the locket and the four or how about 40 others that it disagrees with, none of them are that old. So which do you go with? The one that's older with fewer or the ones that are, uh, and often they'll end up going with the one that's the oldest if they can. So. They try to do that. And so you think, okay, well, what difference does it make? Uh, there's a couple of really famous verses that are worth looking at to give you a sense of how this plays out. We've all been to Central Park, right? Do you know what the name of the fountain is by the boathouse with the statue of the angel and all that? Anybody know what that's called? Bethesda? Bethesda Fountain. Okay, so... The story of Bethesda Fountain is found in the Bible. Can you see my, my thing? I'll blow it up a little bit if I can. Um, I can't. Uh, there we go. Can you see it? So this is John chapter 5. I'm back in the King James. Uh, there was a feast of the Jews. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now at Jerusalem, there was a sheep market at a pool, which is called in Hebrew uh, oh, Bethesda. Okay having five porches. Uh, Charlotte, we've been there. Barbara, we've been there. We went to this on our, that was where yes. in, uh, we had the healing service in Jerusalem. And uh, in these, a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving wa of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole, of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there and it goes on. And the man is healed. And you remember this story, he picks up his mat at the end of it and goes away. So watch the magic here. Okay, watch verse four. I'm gonna to change to a different translation. New Revised Standard Version. Boop. Verse three, in these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. No verse four. One man was there who had been ill for 38 <laughs> years. So what happened to verse four? Well, let's click the link. In other ancient authorities, they add holy or in part, waiting for the stirring of the water. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well from whatever disease that person had. So that's verse four. It's not here. If you go to Central Park, you will see a fountain with an angel stirring up the water, right? That's what that fountain is. That's why it's called Bethesda Fountain. And if you go to Jerusalem, which uh, several of us have been there, you can go and visit this actual place. And they have uncovered, uh, Charlotte and Barbara, you may remember this. It was a big deal that the archaeologists had discovered the five porticos because now they were able to actually determine, A, where this place was, and B, that it actually existed. And so this was a pretty big deal, but where did verse four go? And the answer is that when you're dealing with manuscripts, some manuscripts have verse four and some manuscripts do not have verse four. 
And when they translated the King James, the best academic view on this was that verse four was part of the scriptures. And they certainly knew that they were manuscripts that didn't have verse four. But the decision they made was that verse four needed to be put in. In the New Revised Standard Version, the decision that they made was that the manuscript evidence meant that verse four was probably an addition. It's really impossible to know on this. There's a couple of other things like this where in Luke, I think it is, let's jump to Luke, and Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is praying. And here's another one. So right here, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And then in brackets, then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. You probably remember that verse. It's in brackets, though. And again, the note will tell us that other ancient authorities do not have these two verses. And so what translations will do is when there is a question over verses that appear in one manuscript and don't appear in another manuscript, they will make one of three decisions. They will either put it in and put a note that says other manuscripts don't have this, or they'll put it in with brackets and say that other manuscripts don't have it. And the difference between those two is that the first one, where it's just a note, means that they're about 95% sure that it's, or higher, that it was definitely in the text. When they put it in brackets, it's kind of like 50-50. We don't know, but we're not really sure if we should take it out. And when they pull it out, as they do with the angel stirring up the water, uh, they're making a decision that they think uh, justifies it not being read as part of this text. And they put a note so that you can still read it. Uh, that's a really complicated thing. There's a couple more famous passages where this shows up. Uh, I'll show you one right now. So when you're reading your Bibles, keep a, an eye on those little brackets and those notes. So this, you probably know this story quite well. This is the woman caught in adultery in St. John's Gospel. Remember where Jesus is writing on the ground with uh, his finger? And if you look, it starts at the end of chapter 7. And it starts with brackets. And if you jump to chapter eight, the whole story of the woman who's caught in adultery, and this is the one where Jesus says, uh, whoever has, is without sin can cast the first stone, right? We, mem we remember this very well. It's read pretty regularly, but it's in brackets. And if you look at the note, it says, this is really weird. Most ancient authorities lack these verses. Other authorities add the passage here at the beginning of chapter 8 or after John 7.36 or after 21.25. That's after the resurrection. So there are versions in St. John's Gospel where this story happens after the resurrection and Jesus is encountered and still teaching after he rises from the dead. And the last one is Luke 21, and this is near the end of the Gospel. So how weird is that? This story about whoever has no sin can cast the first stone in some versions appears in St. John's Gospel, and in other manuscripts it appears in St. Luke's Gospel. Like, that's very strange that this story floats from one to the other. So they put it into St. John's Gospel, and we know of it, but we, when you're reading, and this is why a uh, study Bible is really useful, those notes will cue you into these things, and you'll think, oh, okay, um, that's fascinating, or that sort of thing, but sometimes when you're in church, and you don't hear something read, and you think, I always thought the angel stirred up the water. Well, now you know, when we don't read that, because it's not in the version that we're reading right now, that it still is there, it's just in the note, if that makes sense. Um, jumping a little bit ahead, because I'm, I'm running out of time, the, and maybe we should continue this next time, I don't know if this is interesting enough to keep going, but how you translate words also matters. Uh, English sometimes have multiple meanings for words, 
and you can translate it one way or the other. The word bear, B-E-A-R, right? You can bear as in carry something or you can bear as in like a thing that comes out of the woods and eats your food, right? Or you, it's spelled the same way. And there's other words that are like that. And Hebrew and Greek both have those. The most useful one is the word for spirit, is the same word for breath, is the same word for wind. So uh, when Jesus and John 3 is talking about the spirit moves like the wind. He's playing mm -hmm. off of the two different meanings of it. And at the beginning of Genesis, the spirit moved over the waters. Uh, some translations will say the breath of God. Some will say the wind. Some will say the spirit. They're all accurate translations trying to illustrate how it is that God creates. You know, is it just a spirit? Is it just a wind? Or is it like the breath of God? And a good translation will have a note on that saying you can translate this one way or the other. The other words, and this, this happens a lot, is that uh, sometimes for the modern ear, we will have translations that expand on the meaning of the words. So St. Paul, when he's writing, was generally writing to church leaders, and whether or not they were male, uh, is a different question, but for the most part, he's always says brothers when he's writing to the churches. Usually when we read that in church, you're hearing either brethren or brothers and sisters, and they've taken brothers and they've expanded it to brothers and sisters because the understanding is that he was probably speaking to the entire church, and so nowadays we're hearing it and we mean the entire church to hear this, and so we hear this. So the meaning behind the literal translation is what's being used. As you can imagine, that gets really problematic really fast, right? Like if the word, if it says brothers and you say brothers and sisters, you can probably defend that. But there are other times where getting to the meaning behind the text is really, really problematic. And you know the phrase or uh, expression, son of man, Jesus uses that all the time. Um, our Bible, the NRSV, often will translate that Hebrew expression as mortal or one like a human being, because to ancient Hebrew ears, they would have heard the expression son of man as a euphemism for a human being or a mortal. The problem is, if you translate son of man as mortal, and if you read the book of Ezekiel, it shows up as mortal over and over and over again. When we read Ezekiel, the, the dry bones passage, every year we read that on the Easter vigil. And you probably used to hear, son of man, you know, prophesy to this breath, prophesy to these bones, son of man, son of man, son of man. Now, when you hear it, and this year when Eric reads it for the Easter vigil, you will hear mortal, prophesy, prophesy. And from a translation perspective, out of context, that's perfectly fine. That's what Hebrew Jewish listeners would have heard when hearing this Ezekiel passage. However, from a Christian perspective, because Jesus is, and we'll cover this in a later Bible study, Son of Man is its own class, but Jesus uses Son of Man in a really specific and elevated way, not just as one like a human being or one who is immortal. He uses it in a sense that Daniel in the book of Daniel uses it, which is this heavenly figure, the son of man that comes on the clouds. And mm -hmm. so we lose that connection when we hear mortal, whereas in, in other translations, it would have been, you would have heard on Easter vigil, son of man prophesied to this breath and your ears would have perked up and you'd be like, ah, Ezekiel is a whole lot like Jesus, right? The son of man who brings resurrection and new life uh, to these dry, dead bones, but we've lost that connection. Now we just have the story. So that translation of Son of Man really makes a big difference how you do it one way or the other. There are other times where a literal translation um, may be hard on modern ears. There's a passage in Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 to 2, which I recommend you look up at some point, um, which shows that uh, the example used is very um, of a farmer who's taking care of an animal. 
And in the King James, that image is crystal clear. In the New Revised Standard Version, they've modified the language so that it's a mother taking care of her child, which is not the same thing, but it resonates differently and gets to the meaning behind the text. Super complicated. The NRSV is a very good translation. It does that, in my opinion, way too often, where they try to get behind the text and it will be an outdated translation faster than it wants to be because of that. Uh, generally, it's less readable if it's more literal, but you run into um, uh, different issues if you try to, to make it more easily hearable for modern audiences. Um, so I, I have to go, I have another meeting. And so I, leave, I, I only got through about half of the stuff I wanted to do, but uh, do we, was this interesting? Do you want to continue talking about this next time and kind of dig into some more of these verses? Because I'm happy to do that and, and, and modify our schedule a little bit. Does that work? Yes, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry to run off and uh, it's great to see you all, but I, I have a meeting that I have to be on in one minute. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank okay. you. God bless, I'll thank see you, you next week. So thank we'll continue you. with translations next week a little bit, yes. okay? Okay, okay. All right. great. Okay, bye-bye. Bye now. Bye. 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 Bye.